Hey everyone, so we're going to try to uh, cover actually two sections for this screencast. Luckily, it's, this stuff's pretty easy, and you guys seem to be doing really well with it. So I'm going to uh, try to get through sections 7.3 uh, and 7.4 for this screencast. So 7.3 is all about ATP. We learned about ATP uh, during our studies of photosynthesis. Okay, so during photosynthesis, the chloroplast will make a little bit of ATP. Uh, but in cell respiration, we're going to make a lot of ATP. So uh, there's a really big difference in the amount of ATP that's made. You know that ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. So uh, this uh, adenosine is composed of uh, an adenine. Actually, adenosine is up here. Uh, it's composed of an adenine. It's a nitrogen-containing compound. Uh, it's composed of a sugar called ribose. Uh, by the way, those details you do not need to know for the test. I just want you to know that uh, this is the adenosine. And this is the triphosphate tail. One, two, three phosphates. Phosphates are negatively charged, so you want to think of uh, each of these phosphates being negative. And when you compress uh, similar charges together, they want to repel one another, right? So when you put these three phosphates together, it is much like compressing a spring. Okay, in fact, your book draws it as a spring right here. Okay, so when you compress that spring, you are creating a bunch of potential energy. So stored energy uh, in this ATP molecule. So ATP is, is high potential energy. Now, if you wanted to release some of that energy, all you'd have to do is basically break off this last phosphate, and this last phosphate would go somewhere. And what you'd be left with is ADP, so adenosine diphosphate, there's two, and then this extra phosphate, which would go away. Okay, so uh, I want you to think of this as a spring. And basically, when you cleave off this last phosphate, you're basically releasing the spring. Okay, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's going from high potential energy to kinetic. That spring movement would be kinetic, and there'd be a lot of energy stored uh, in there. Okay, so uh, this energy is a lot like a jack-in-the-box. Yeah, so I never get tired of watching that. Uh, okay, so in that situation, the jack-in-the-box compressed in the box would be like ATP, lots of potential energy. Uh, but when you cleave off that last phosphate, that's the jack-in-the-box springing forward and potentially traumatizing uh, a child. Okay, ATP is renewable. Okay, so ATP, and you learn this also in, in uh, photosynthesis, ATP, when broken down, to ADP and phosphate releases energy. So we get that energy, that energy is used for the cell. Uh, so that movement of ATP can literally be, be used to make chemical reactions happen, to make molecules in the cell move, to open up, for example, membrane receptors, okay? But you also know that this ADP and phosphate can be uh, recombined to create ATP. The new part of this is uh, this reaction is that you know that you need to get uh, the energy from food. So you need to unlock the chemical energy that's found in the foods that you eat to do this. So it's going to take some energy investment to make this ATP happen. Okay, so this is moving into 7.4. Uh, for 7.4, one of the things that they emphasize is that the fact that you're going to make a lot of ATP in this process of cellular respiration. Okay, you know that uh, these are the reactants and these are the products, but the really most important uh, product from cell respiration is, is ATP. It's what we're going to use to, uh, to make a lot of our, our chemical reactions and a lot of cellular movement happen. We also discussed in class how uh, cellular respiration is a lot like cellular breathing. Okay, uh, we know that when we breathe, we take in 
oxygen from the atmosphere that goes into our lungs, blood vessels and, and capillaries and whatnot that pass through our, our, our lungs will pick up this gas and transport this gas to the cells that need it, right? So if you're going to go to a muscle cell, the muscle cell is going to take in some of this oxygen and use it to perform cellular respiration. Remember, this is a requirement for the process. Now, once the muscle cells do this, they're creating uh, a toxic byproduct for humans and for other animals called carbon dioxide. You also know that from, from their equation. The carbon dioxide uses the same pathway uh, back. I mean, they're using different blood vessels and, and whatnot, but they're, they're using the same system back to the lungs to be uh, removed from our cells, right? So these muscle cells will put carbon dioxide into the bloodstream. That bloodstream will travel to the lungs. And from the lungs, we will exhale it uh, out back into the world. Okay, and then this carbon dioxide can go off and, and play a role in photosynthesis. So again, I just want to kind of emphasize the connections between these two pathways. Uh, when we take the test, you'll see that you know a lot of the, the review from the last chapter will be in the form of a, a relationship between cellular respiration and photosynthesis. Okay. Now we're getting into a little bit of the of the nitty gritty details here uh, with with cellular respiration. Okay. If you take in a fuel like sugar, like this glucose here, we all know that you need oxygen to burn it. Okay, so literally, if if you were to set fire uh, to this glucose, it would burn. In a lot of ways, the cell is doing the same way, the same thing. So, you know, we're not setting little fires uh, ablaze inside of our cells. Uh, we're performing chemical reactions to burn it. Uh, so it's like a controlled burn. We don't burn it all at once. We we break it down step by step, and you'll see that uh, when we get into glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, it's a step by step basically uh, disassembling of these of these uh, macromolecules, right? So sugars are an example of a macromolecule. Okay, um, so if you were to burn sugar, ask yourself what you would see the energy release as, right? So if you, if you set something a, a blaze, basically you lose all of its energy at once. You don't capture it, you don't harness it and kind of take advantage of it. Instead, you get this big burst of heat and light. And that, those are the forms of energy that are being created from something when it when it's set ablaze like this sugar is or like a piece of wood is when it's set on a campfire. Lots of heat, lots of light, and those are the energy forms basically escaping, basically being wasted. Now, if you wanted to experimentally determine what you get in addition to all this energy from burning something like sugar, you could literally uh, capture uh, some of the some of the remnants or some of the, the products that are released from uh, from this burning, right? So if you were to tip a bowl over a fire, you would collect some water, some vaporization, some droplets would condense, and you'd see water. You'd also be able to uh, capture carbon dioxide as a gas. I mean, most of that gas is going to be released, so it's it's hard to capture carbon dioxide. But you would also uh, capture some some carbon. Um, Residue, I guess is the best way to say it. Carbon residue, right? So in a fire, when you see that kind of black black smoke curling out, uh, a lot of the the black component to that is that is that carbon being burned. Um, and literally, like if you set a candle next to a wall too close, you'll get like a black smudging, and that's that carbon residue from the sugars, which have a, which have a lot of carbon in them. All right, moving right along. This last slide. Uh, is is where we start to get really technical with the uh, the process of cellular respiration. Uh, many of you, hopefully, will remember that the electronic <laughs> electronic electron transport chain. You guys got me saying that uh, the electron transport chain uh, is involved in photosynthesis, right? You hopefully you remember that, right? It's involved in the light reactions. What I want to emphasize here is that it's also involved in cellular respiration. So literally, this uh, these, this uh, chain of proteins that in photosynthesis bridge the photosystems is also going to be found in cellular respiration. Okay, now you're not going to get photosystems in cellular respiration; those are a a, um, a photosynthesis thing. But you do get this still connection of proteins inside the membrane. It's going to be a different membrane now because remember we're in photosynthesis we are working in the chloroplasts. 
cellular respiration, we are working in the mitochondria. Mitochondrion for singular. Okay, so this, the membrane that the this electron transport chain is um, embedded in is going to be different. But the principle is the same. Electron carriers will bring electrons to the chain, and basically you'll get this passing along of uh, the electrons. So that when they get to the end, they're low energy, just like in uh, photosynthesis. They start out high. Here's where the differences um, start to start to accumulate, right? So at the end of the electron transport chain, in photosynthesis, you loaded those electrons onto the second photosystem in the pathway. During cellular respiration, you're going to load those electrons, those low energy electrons, now onto oxygen. Okay, and so we're going to cover this again when we cover. Uh, like oxidative phosphorylation in the electron transport chain, but basically those electrons go on to oxygen. Oxygen then takes several hydrogen ions. We know that if you have an O plus two H's, you can make water, H2O. Okay, so for cell respiration, electrons are basically taken from our food, so let's just say like from glucose or some of the molecules that are that are basically created from these processes. I'm, I'm being sim uh, simplifying it here a little bit, but you take those electrons, you put them onto a carrier, carrier takes them to the ETC, they're passed along the ETC, and instead of going to another photosystem, which doesn't exist in cellular respiration, we're gonna we're gonna put them onto oxygen. So oxygen, guys, this is really important. Oxygen is drawing electrons through the ETC. Okay, so if you if you think of uh, glucose here as a starting point, basically it's going. Uh, all the electrons that are taken from that glucose are going to be drawn towards this oxygen right here. Okay, so the oxygen is pulling them through the electron transport chain. Then when that oxygen takes a hydrogen, a couple of hydrogens actually, and it takes those electrons, it creates water. This is why water is a product of cell respiration, guys. This is why, um, in addition to uh, energy, and in addition to carbon dioxide, you get water. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. We're going to cover this last slide, especially in a, in a whole separate screencast. So don't worry if you don't get it just yet. Uh, we're going to come back to it in a, in a little while. Okay, so I hope that makes sense, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.